Hi everybody. Um, so we are beginning the carbon cycle part of the water and carbon cycle module. Um, it clearly is a module divided into two sections and uh, this is the uh, official beginning of the carbon cycle. Now the carbon cycle is uh, something you will find tons of videos about on the internet, lots of websites, lots of help. Um, it's taught in science, it's taught in geography, it's taught at loads of different levels. So if this is something that you struggle with, um, yeah, you will find lots of help. The YouTube link on screen is from a NASA video about the carbon cycle, which I think is brilliant, but there are BBC bite-sized ones and all sorts. So please don't feel that you've only got my videos to help you with the carbon cycle. You've actually got hundreds of people's videos to help you. So the first thing that I want to talk about is um, the fact that carbon is everywhere. It's a little bit more complicated to learn than the water cycle, not because the ideas in it are more complicated, not at all. It's just that carbon is everywhere. <laughs> um, every living thing is made out of carbon, which means that dead things are also made out of carbon. And basically, carbon's just everywhere, which means that learning all of the different bits of the cycle is there's just more words and, and more stuff to learn, okay? Um, what I'm going to attempt to do is go through the words and phrases that you might hear and try to help you understand what they mean. Um, I'm going to show you a few different uh, versions of drawings of the carbon cycle to try and help you understand that. But um, yeah, <laughs> as I keep saying, don't limit yourself just to this video. There are loads available about the carbon cycle. Okay, so a few words on there about some of the obvious stores, possibly a couple of new words to you. Um, lithosphere, if you do environmental science or geology, I'm sure this will be very uh, familiar to you. Um, cryosphere, you should know from the water cycle. But um, yeah, if they're new words, you might want to just jot them down. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, some keywords and phrases associated with the carbon cycle and sort of just define them and talk about them. Obviously, you're free to make notes if you want to. To try and make your lives that teeny little bit easier, we are going to take the starting and finishing point for the carbon cycle as being the atmosphere. If you think logically, because the carbon cycle is a loop, you could you could pick any start finish point that you wanted to, but we use the atmosphere as a start finish point in the water cycle, and it just makes your lives easier if we have the same place. Okay, right. So carbon that you would find in the atmosphere is most likely to be in the form of gases. Um, everyone's heard of carbon dioxide, particularly in the age of climate change. Uh, you may not be so familiar with methane, which is CH4, if you're familiar with chemical uh, symbols. Um, but methane actually is probably even more of a concern for climate change than carbon dioxide. And by the end of this module, you certainly should be very familiar with methane, or uh, if you want to pronounce it the American way, methane. Combustion. Combustion is a posh word for burning. And um, we burn a huge amount of carbon in the form of fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels are coal, oil and gas. And you might possibly know why they're called fossil fuels, but if you don't, uh, they're made out of dead things. Coal, oil and gas are made out of dead plants and animals. That's why they're called fossil fuels. And if all living things contain carbon, and therefore all dead things contain carbon, when we burn coal, oil and gas, we are putting loads of carbon back into the atmosphere. This is the big problem area that we have right now with climate change, because all of that carbon was quite happily sat underground, minding its own business, being safely stored away. We're digging it up at a massive rate of knots, burning it, 
and putting it all back into the atmosphere. So this is a, a big problem area. Coal, some people might use it on their fires. It gets used in manufacturing, um, particularly in China. Coal is um, used quite a lot in China. We're all guilty of using oil. Um, oil becomes many different products. It becomes petrol, diesel, kerosene, which is aeroplane fuel. It becomes heavy diesel for trains. Um, yeah, most of us will be using oil on you know pretty much a daily basis for our transport needs. Uh, and natural gas probably uh, powers your central heating. You might have not got a gas hob at home and so on and so forth. So this is our, our big problem area. Right, carbonic acid, chemical weathering. Carbonic acid sounds quite scary, but actually when rain falls through the atmosphere, it combines with carbon dioxide and it becomes a weak acid. Obviously, you know from being alive this long, you don't dissolve when it lands on you. It's not that strong, but natural rainwater is slightly acidic. It's called carbonic acid. And it will lead to certain rocks weathering. Limestone is particularly susceptible to this, uh, which is where you get your stalactites and stalagmites and all that business. Okay, but that is a movement of um, carbon because the CO2 combines with the water to form carbonic acid. And you can see that over the years that will dissolve limestone statues and other things. Hopefully you'll remember this a little bit from coasts when we talk about weathering in coasts. So neutral, uh, sorry, natural water is neutral. Uh, yes, that's right. But rain is usually about pH 5.6. So there, carbonic acid falls out the sky. And that's one of the links uh, between the water and carbon cycles that we'll pick up on later in the module. Right, photosynthesis. If you're doing A-level biology, you know all about this, probably more than you wish to. <laughs> but uh, photosynthesis is uh, where plants make their own food. They take in carbon dioxide and water and they make glucose, which is a carbohydrate. There is the carbon, look. And thank goodness plants photosynthesize because it's the bottom of every food chain. If they didn't, we wouldn't be here, essentially. Respiration, something all living things do, and I've put in big letters at the top of the slide, plants respire too, because that gets forgotten. People remember that plants photosynthesize and make their own food, but they forget that they respire. Um, yes, of course, humans do, animals do, but so do plants. And it is also part of the carbon cycle. So I've reminded you, here about look all this carbon all this lovely carbon and then carbon see I said it's everywhere it's everywhere ladies and gents now I won't leave this picture up for very long because it's not very nice death and decay I'm afraid death and decay um, is vital in the carbon cycle because um, if all living things contain carbon and then all dead things contain carbon that carbon then has to be broken down by decomposers and that happens to all dead things. Sorry, I know that's horrible. Consumption, eating, apart from plants, which rather brilliantly make their own food, courtesy of photosynthesis, which we've already talked about, everything else has to eat something else. Maybe plants, maybe other animals. But food chains are essentially just transfers of carbon. That's the way to think of them, because every time uh, something eats something else, it is eating carbon. Uh, I should just point out, and I definitely didn't want to include a photograph of this, defecation, or um, <clears throat> how can I put this nicely, going to the toilet um, is also, you're going to have some carbon uh, in that as well. Right, some things get fossilised. Not actually very many. The chances of getting fossilised are minuscule percentage-wise, but some things get fossilised. And I, I know I keep repeating this, and you're going to be so fed up of me saying it, but if all living things contain carbon and all dead things contain carbon, clearly fossils are going to contain carbon. Shell building. 
Uh, this can happen on land and under the sea. Shells and corals, which are a form of shell, shells and corals are made out of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, carbon yet again, ladies and gents. So any shell building or coral building is um, carbon as well. Um, and that's basically how you create calcium carbonate. Just, just so you know. Um, but look, carbon, carbon, carbon. It is very definitely part of the carbon cycle. Volcanic eruptions produce carbon dioxide. Uh, this is the current eruption in Iceland, 2021, uh, which will be definitely producing CO2. There's a very famous volcano that you'll learn about in um, year two, and this is Lake Nyos, N-Y-O-S, which has massive eruptions of carbon dioxide, um, which unfortunately have killed many people in the past because they, the cloud of CO2 that gets created just suffocates everything in its path, which is pretty miserable. So volcanoes, yeah, definitely. Plants, plants um, are stores of carbon, and as they grow, got some nice tree rings here, more and more carbon gets stored and of course that's all thanks to photosynthesis that we talked about before. Animals are stores of carbon and we've already mentioned food chains which are transfers of carbon. Growth. Plants grow, animals grow, humans grow. The more you grow, the more carbon, carbon <laughs> you store. Right, diffusion. This is quite an important one. So this is the surface of the sea, and this is the atmosphere. And as CO2 molecules strike the water, they combine uh, to make carbonic acid again. Hopefully you're like, oh, carbonic acid, I've heard of this before. When uh, raindrops fall through the atmosphere, the um, raindrop combines with CO2 and makes carbonic acid. It also happens uh, near the surface of the sea. It's exactly the same basic idea, but this time we call it diffusion, please. Okay, soil organic matter, dead organic matter or humus. Animals die, plants die, but I want to talk about the stuff that you get in the soil. Not to be confused with a rather lovely chickpea dip called hummus, which is spelt differently, and you might make your examiner have a little giggle to themselves if you muddle the two up, but um, I certainly wouldn't muddle them up in real life. I certainly wouldn't want to dip uh, some cucumber sticks into humus. Thank you very much. Ugh. Um, anyway, humus, not hummus. You can call it soil organic matter, dead organic matter, which can be shortened to D-O-M or humus. But when dead plants and animals decompose, they become uh, this brown jelly-like substance, which you find in soil. It's in fact what gives soil its brown colour, don't you know? Uh, but it's very important. Food chains happen in the sea as much as they do on land. Just to remind you that pretty much everything that happens on land for the carbon cycle happens in the sea too. Uh, the things that uh, photosynthesize in the sea are called phytoplankton. I'm sure biologists know lots about them. Rocks. Rocks are one of the biggest stores in the carbon cycle and they are created, or I should say can be created. Sedimentary rocks are created by something called lithification. Um, and essentially it's where sediment just gets subjected to such huge amounts of pressure and sometimes uh, heat that they uh, get turned into rock. That is where your fossils might be created as well. If dead things were in this mud, they may well survive this process and become fossilized. Uh, it's also the same basic idea that creates your fossil fuels, the same basic principles. Okay, there are other types of rock, but as we're geographers and not geologists, we don't really need to talk about that too much. Sequestration is a word that you might be like, what on earth is this? Sequestration, as it says, is long-term storage of carbon. There could be natural sequestration, um, 
so in fossil fuels, in rocks at the bottom of the sea, etc. We are now desperately trying to find human versions of this because, as I mentioned to you earlier, we are, have now put so much carbon in the atmosphere because we've taken the fossil fuels out of the ground and we've burned them. We are now desperately trying to backpedal and figure out ways of, of getting that carbon back out of the atmosphere again. So one thing that we're trying to do is we're trying to take carbon uh, and pump it underground. So like <laughs> kind of almost the reverse of, of mining fossil fuels. Let, let's hide it underground. But sequestration is about long-term storage. It can be natural or it can be human. And then um, the final one that I'm going to talk about, rivers are obviously going to get rainwater in them, which we now know is carbonic acid. So rivers are kind of technically part of the water cycle and the carbon cycle. But also we talked about weathering uh, and how rocks, particularly limestones, get weathered quite easily by this carbonic acid. And that weathered material may well end up being transported by rivers. So they are part of the carbon cycle as much as they are part of the water cycle. OK, now there's a couple of links there. If you find the carbon cycle a bit intangible, a bit hard to understand, um, so the top one is a game where you are a molecule of carbon <laughs> and you have to like navigate your way around the carbon cycle. Some people find it too babyish and some people think it's really helpful. So there's that. And the bottom one is this interactive carbon cycle diagram where you can click on different parts of it and it will kind of simulate what's happening. So if I yeah, can offer anything in particular, I'd offer those. But as I said at the beginning, lots of websites, lots of videos. And then I'm just going to show you a couple of different versions of diagrams. There are so many ways of drawing it. If you're a visual learner, my version is probably most similar to that, the one that I draw in class. But some people prefer like a flow diagram kind of idea. Some people prefer trying to keep it simple. Just play around with a couple. And then the, the final thing uh, is to go back to the idea of a systems approach. Remembering that systems have inputs, outputs, stores and processes. Every single system has those. If, and I need to emphasise this to you, if we take the atmosphere as the start and finish point, you can colour code in this way, but it is a cycle. Technically, we could pinpoint any one place and go, right, that's the start finish point. And of course, it would completely change what the inputs and the outputs are. But because for the water cycle, we take the atmosphere as the start finish point, we might as well apply the same logic to the carbon cycle, in which case uh, you can colour code your parts um, accordingly. OK, so good luck with all of that. Um, I know uh, some of you will get on with it really well and others might struggle, but that's why you have teachers. So you can go, I don't get it. Please help me.